Well, let's commence then our worship this morning, and to do so, I read from the Word of God, and let us hear his word then as I read some verses from the opening of Psalm 111. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honourable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth for ever. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He hath showed his people the power of his works, that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast for ever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant for ever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. So let's call upon the Lord now in prayer. O oh God, we thank thee for the remembrance of thy holy name and of thy wonderful works. We think of thee as being the creator of all heaven and earth. And we think too, O oh Lord, of the wonderful works which thou hast done in the salvation of thy people. And we come before thee this morning, remembering these great and wonderful works indeed. And as we do so, we praise thy great and holy name. O oh Lord, help us in this coming hour of worship. Help us to be reverent. Help us to be mindful of thy holy being and help us that we may receive from thy word the lessons and the doctrines that are there for us to grasp and understand. And may thy word do us good this morning. And to that end, we pray for the ministry of thy spirit. And we ask that he may come and be our teacher and lead us and guide us into all truth. So, Lord, hear us as we Come with our prayers and our petitions and grant the help that we need that all that is said and done in this coming hour may be pleasing in thy sight and may thus bring blessing upon our souls. Lord, we ask thee to hear our prayers and all these things that we ask, we do so in our Saviour's name. Amen. I'm going to read the words of our opening him based upon Psalm 138. So it's number 138 in Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship. With all my powers of heart and tongue, I'll praise my maker in my song. May nothing mar the song I raise, nor earthly idols steal thy praise. I'll sing thy truth and mercy, Lord, and the great wonders of thy word. Not all thy works on earth below, so much thy power and glory show. To thee I cried in my distress, in mercy thou didst hear and bless, and did my doubts and fears control, imparting strength through all my soul. The King of heaven maintains his state, frowns on the proud and scorns the great, but from his throne descends to know repenting sinners here below. Troubled by numerous snares I stand, upheld and guarded by thy hand. Thy comforts keep my soul alive and bid my downcast heart revive. Grace will complete what grace begins to save from sorrows or from sins, the work our Saviour undertakes, eternal mercy 
Never thanks. Well, now let's turn together to the word of God. And our first reading this morning is from the book of the Revelation and in chapter four. In the book of the Revelation and in chapter four. And we begin to read from the first verse. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders, sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth for ever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth for ever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Well, may God bless to us the reading of his holy word. Now let's call upon him together in prayer. Our Lord, we thank thee for the scriptures. We thank thee for the revelation that we have, not only for the book that bears that name for, for, for all the book of God. For all of the book of God is revelation to us, showing us, unfolding to us, things that otherwise we would not know. And we thank thee, O God, that the central theme of thy book is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Redeemer of sinners. So early on were promises made concerning him, and from that time, the whole word of God has reference to him, to his coming, to the reason for his coming and the outcome of it all in the end. And so, O oh Lord, our eyes are immediately directed as we think of thy word to thy son, who is our saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we would pray, O oh Lord, this morning that thou wilt give us an understanding of him and a better grasp of his greatness and of his glory and of the gospel of his redeeming grace. We thank thee, O Lord, that he came into this world and the specific reason for his coming was to be the saviour of sinners. We know that for that to happen, it meant that he must become a man and take to himself a human nature. And in that nature, to live in this world under the law of God, fulfilling the law of God, 
and then as a man dying in the place of sinners upon the Calvary's cross, that sinners might look to him and receive pardon for sin and receive the gift of everlasting life. O Lord, thy word is full of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray that our hearts may be full of him too, and full of faith in him, and that trust in him, which alone brings us the forgiveness of sin and salvation forevermore. So, Lord, we thank thee for thy Son. We thank thee for all the truth that we have in the scriptures concerning him. And may we be better students of thy word and better fitted to worship thee and to praise thee for all the wonderful works of God and especially in the salvation that has been worked out for us in the Son of God himself. But we think too, O Lord, of the fact that thou art a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we would not lose sight of any of these three persons that belong to the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We think of the Spirit and the work that's given to him to convict us of our sins, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. And we pray, O Lord, that as we consider thy word this morning, that he would perform those works in our own hearts to convict us of our sin, to convict us of what righteousness is and of how far short we fall from it and how we need it for ourselves in order to stand before thee and of that judgment that will come, that will surely come to all men one day. O oh Lord, we pray that he will be effectual in our thoughts this morning and in our hearts, that he may then go on to lead us unto the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Saviour, the true Saviour, the wonderful Saviour, who stands ready to accept and to receive all who come to him. And we pray, O oh God, that we may come to him this morning, and that our faith may be in him. And we pray that many others across the world may recognise him to be the true answer to uh, their needs. We ask, O oh Lord, then for a work of grace to be done across the world. We think of the world as it is at this time, showing so many symptoms of what's wrong with it at its heart, a world that's in rebellion against God, a world that refuses God, a world that proudly goes on its own way, thinking that it can solve its problems and resolve the issues that are before it. And none think of thee. Truly, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The th God is not in all their thoughts. We know this. We see it on every hand. O oh Lord, we pray that thou will have mercy upon many today and bring many people to an awareness of the true state of things, of how far we are from thee, of what danger we stand in without thee, as our saviour and O oh lord we pray that in our country and in the western countries and in all the countries of the world there may be a great work of redemption done in many many hearts this day and so we pray for the preaching of thy word that goes out across the internet we thank thee O oh lord that even in days like this thy word is not bound but it does go forth and we are sure for thy word says so, that it will accomplish all that God sends it forth to do. So we thank thee, Lord, that we can have confidence in thy works and in thy ways. And even in days like this, we thank thee that though we are under thy judgment, yet we can see tokens of thy mercy, tokens of God's grace, those preachings of thy word, that testimony that is born to the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we pray, do a work of saving grace then, we beseech thee in many hearts. And now we think of ourselves, we think of our own needs as we go from day to day in this hard period of our lives, these times of great difficulty, of confusion, of anxiety and of fear. And we ask, O oh Lord, that in the midst of it all, we may lift up our eyes unto thee and find in thee the one who is able and the one who is wise, and the one who is good. 
the one who can do what we cannot do, the one who can look into the future and see what we cannot see, the one who holds all things in his own hands. O oh Lord, may our confidence be in thee then for all of the troubles that we face and the burdens that we bear. And we know that there will be some listening to the ministry this morning that bear very great burdens and face very heavy trials. There are some, O oh Lord, that wonder about the future of their employment. There are others who are concerned about their health. There are others that are concerned about their family members. There are others that are concerned about things that perhaps we know nothing of. But God knows all things, and God is able to deal with all things. And we pray that we may have that trust in thee, first for salvation, but then for all things that touch our lives. O oh Lord, we thank thee for being so gracious to us, for being so kind, for being so compassionate. We thank thee too for being so patient with us. How long and how often we have tried thee and provoked thee to the face. And yet, O oh Lord, thou hast not cast us off. Thou hast not given to us what we deserve, but thou hast preserved us even to today, that we may turn to thee afresh to seek thy face, to seek thy forgiveness for all our many sins, for our persistence in those things, for the ways in which we so regularly and repeatedly fail thee and offend thee. O oh Lord, if we had been dealt with as we deserve, then none of us would be here today. But thou art gracious and kind and good, and we are here today, and we have a further opportunity of seeking thee and of knowing thy pardon and of then going on in the ways of God. O oh Lord, as we look to the future, there is much that we cannot see and there's much that we cannot control. But, O oh Lord, we pray that in whatever circumstances we may find ourselves to be in, in the coming days, we may be those people who walk in the ways of God, whose eyes are upon thee, those who seek to consult thee for all things, and those whose lives are conformed to thy good and thy wonderful commandments. O oh Lord, give us grace, give us strength, give us an awareness of what the enemy of our souls is about, what he seeks to do, how he seeks to create a distance that's even greater between us and God, how he seeks to bring down our faith, how he seeks to divide us, even as a people. O oh Lord, we pray that we may not be ignorant of his devices and that we shall not be asleep when he approaches. But, O oh Lord, help us that we may keep our eyes upon our Saviour and be determined by his grace to follow him. We know that that is the way of righteousness and it's therefore the way of peace. It's the way that we can, in which we can depend upon our God to grant us his blessings and his enabling. So Lord, we wait upon thee this morning with our prayers and our petitions. We think of the many that are in our own country, the many that are in Chichester today especially, and we pray for them that wherever they are and whatever their condition is, in some way their thoughts may be turned heavenward and they will seek thee to be their God and their saviour. We pray, O oh Lord, for the elderly shut into their homes, unable to go out still, and those that are unable to tune in to uh, services of worship on the Lord's day. We pray as well for the young, we thank thee for the teaching that is being given to them over the internet and in many cases in their own homes by their parents. And we pray, O oh Lord, that the word taught may lodge in their hearts. They remember these things and trust in the Saviour and early in their lives know him to be their Redeemer. O oh Lord, then bless us all today. Our eyes are upon thee, the God of all grace and the God of mercy. And we come in humble dependence upon thee, seeking that thou wilt fill us with the good things of thy word and establish us in the good truths of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So grant us thy blessing as we continue together and help us, O Lord, every one of us. For we ask it all in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. 
Now I'm going to read the words of a further hymn, a hymn that has to do very much, of course, with the faithfulness of God. It's the hymn number 179 in our book. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions, they fail not, as thou hast been forever, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand has provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin, and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, and bright hope for tomorrow, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, and so on. We could go on reading those words and rejoicing in the truth of them. And we thank God for the truth of his great faithfulness. Now let's turn together to the word of God. And we go back into the Old Testament and to the book of Genesis, reading from the end of chapter 8 and then into chapter 9. So in the book of Genesis, chapter 8, and reading from verse 15, these verses, of course, follow on from the record that we have in the word of God of the great flood that was sent by the Lord into the world. So Genesis 8 verse 15, and let us hear the word of God. God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air 
upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you, be ye fruitful, and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah, and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl of the cattle, and of the every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark, to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh, that is upon the earth. Well, so reads the word of God, and we're thankful for the word of God and pray that he will give us understanding of it and bless it to us this morning. Well, the theme of the message this morning has to do with God's rainbow and God's rainbow in connection with the covenant which we have seen referred to in that chapter of Genesis, the rainbow. Well, what can we say about the rainbow? There's a kind of scientific uh, explanation and definition of a rainbow. Let me give one that is just plucked at random from the internet. A rainbow is a meteorological phenomenon that is caused by reflection, refraction, and dispersion of light in water droplets resulting in a spectrum of light appearing in the sky. It takes the form of a multicolored circular arc. Rainbows caused by sunlight always appear in the section of sky directly opposite the sun. Well, there you have the scientific definition and explanation of a rainbow. I'm not gonna go into all of that. You can look it up for yourselves and see what the scientists have to say about how it happens as a phenomenon to be seen in the sky. What else can we say about the rainbow? Well, the rainbow, of course, has become a very popular symbol and emblem over the years. It became very uh, uh, prominent in popular culture. as something that stood for hope of better times, the fulfillment of dreams and sentimental kind of songs have been uh, composed over the years with uh, pretty little tunes and people whistle them to get themselves into a mood that is optimistic concerning the present as well as the future. 
But of course, the rainbow has been adopted by various groups, in, especially in, in recent years and times, to um, symbolize their own views about one thing and another. Uh, there are various communities that have adopted this, and we're all familiar with that. I'm not going to comment on those things this morning. That's not my purpose. The Bible has plenty to say about these things, but that's not my purpose this morning. More recently, of course, we have seen that uh, groups, um, and nationally, I suppose, um, the, uh, the rainbow has been taken as a kind of a symbol of peace and hope in the recent crisis that we have experienced and in many ways that we're still in the throes of. The unity that is being expressed in these ways with the, the tremendous efforts of, of health workers and carers of our time. One group, I understand, has complained about the so-called hijacking of the rainbow. We got there first, some say, and it's not fair and reasonable for others to, to use these things. Well, there's a comment in there that um, I, I really gives rise to the sermon this morning. What is the real truth about the rainbow? Where did it come from? And why do we have one that appears in the sky from time to time? Well, the answer to that, of course, is found in Genesis chapter 9. And just to see one verse to begin with this morning, verse 13, Genesis 9, verse 13, where God says to Noah, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. God claimed ownership of the rainbow. He created the rainbow. Now, there are some commentators that, that hold that um, this particular time in Genesis 9 was the time when God first created the whole um, phenomenon of a rainbow. Others think that the rainbow had existed before this and that this is simply a God saying that when I put the rainbow in the cloud, when I cause a rainbow to appear, this long-standing um, phenomenon, it's a sign. Well, either way, it doesn't really matter. What I think we can most certainly conclude is that the intention of the rainbow in the sky, so far as God is concerned, is to be a sign of a covenant. God always had this in his mind, that the rainbow would be a sign of a covenant that he would establish between himself and Noah and all creatures. I do set my bow, he says, in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. So it's created and it's displayed as a token of God's covenant. Now in verses nine to 17, which add up to nine verses, if my arithmetic is correct, there are seven references to a covenant. In verse nine, we read, for example, I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And in verse 11, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. My covenant. You see, my bow, my rainbow, speaking of my covenant, which I establish with you. So the bow in the cloud or the rainbow is a token, verse 13, it is a token of the covenant which I make, a, a token of a covenant which is between me and the earth. And if you look down at verses 14 to 16, the implication there is that God deliberately from time to time causes the rainbow to appear specifically as a remembrance 
of his covenant. It shall come to pass, verse 14, when I bring a cloud over the earth. Who brings the cloud? Why is the cloud there? God brings it. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So you can't get away from the fact that God puts the rainbow in the sky in order for a very specific remembrance of a covenant that he has made between himself, first of all with Noah, and then with the seed, and with all creatures for the duration of this age of the world's history. So the rainbow makes us think about, first of all, the covenant that's one question that we seek to answer. What is this covenant? And then we have to ask another question. Why did God determine to give a token of that covenant? And then to ask a third question, is there more to it than appears on the surface? surface? So these three questions I want to simply try to simply answer this morning. What is the covenant? Why is there a token of the covenant? And what more is there to this covenant and this rainbow that we can determine from the scriptures? Well, first of all, then, what is the covenant? Well, the whole background to this uh, record that we have here of God coming to Noah in the way that he did is, of course, the tremendous and awful, dreadful sinfulness of man and the judgment that inevitably fell upon this world because of man's continued sin, this worldwide flood that came in, from which only Noah and his family were saved. And God came to Noah as we know and told Noah to build an ark. And then God would later come to Noah and say, come into the ark. And Noah and his family came into the ark with uh, the creatures that were also taken into the ark and they alone were preserved when that great flood came across all of the world. Now, following that and following Noah's salvation and the receding of all the waters, we hear about what God's intention was concerning the future that was there in his own heart. And it's described in chapter eight and verses 21 and 22. This incidentally follows the offering of a sacrifice by Noah when he emerged from the ark. And notice that the first thing that Noah thinks of is building an altar that he may sacrifice unto God not about building a home, not about settling down and all the rest of these things that might naturally come to his mind. But no, God has redeemed him. God has saved him. Let's build an altar to bring a sacrifice unto him for his saving grace. So Noah has built the altar and made the sacrifice. And verse 21 of chapter 8 says, The Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more any, every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now notice that this says in verse 21, the Lord said in his heart, this was what was in the heart of God. It wasn't known outside of the heart of God at that time, but that was the intention of the Lord. There would be no repeat of a universal flood, but all will be preserved and the seasons will come and the seasons will go and continue 
while the earth remaineth. But now when we move into chapter 9, God announces what was in his heart and reveals it to Noah, and he does so by means and in the form of a covenant. Now, what is a covenant? A covenant is a compact or an agreement that is established between two parties. It's a, an arrangement where there are conditions and it's an arrangement where promises are made. And a covenant arrangement is intended, of course, to be most certain and most definite. And in setting forth God's promise in terms of a covenant, we have the idea presented to us that what God intends to do, God will most definitely do. And God binds himself to this covenant promise that is made with Noah and Noah's descendants. And this we find described in these verses of chapter 9. Now, a question arises at this point. Why is it that God so promises? That God so promises to withhold any future widespread worldwide destruction of all flesh. He wouldn't flood the world as he had flooded it just recently in Noah's lifetime. Why does he promise to do this? Is it, for example, that he now thinks that he has made a mistake in the flooding the earth? That he was now filled with regrets over what he had done and therefore he vows never to do such a thing again? Had he, for example, acted rashly? Well, we can rule that out because we're told in chapter 6 and in verse 3 that God gives notice of 120 years before this great flood will come. Warnings were given and righteousness was preached by Noah in those years. So this was no rash, sudden outburst of anger against man's sins. Had he, for example, been unjust in punishing the world in the way that he had done? No. Again, if you turn back to chapter 6 and look at verse 5, you'll find that all he could detect in the heart of man was evil continually. And the world deserved justice and judgment. And the world was ripe for that judgment. Would he now think, when he makes this covenant promise, that he would no more flood the earth? Did he now think that things would get better and he wouldn't need to? And it would be unjustified. No, if you look at chapter 8 and verse 21, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That doesn't suggest that there's going to be any improvement in the heart of man. No, so none of these can be adduced as reasons for God not flooding the earth in, the, in, in judgment as the way he had done the first time. So why? Why this promise not to judge the earth in that kind of way, in a universal destruction of all flesh? Well, the simple answer to that is this, that God had a plan for the future to provide a way of salvation that men and women could turn to in advance of a further judgment that would finally come, that would not be by means of a flood, but of a different sort. But in the intervening period, in this period of postponement of a further general judgment of all flesh, there would be implemented this plan of salvation. Even though people are still in their sins, and even though people are so rebellious and so stiff-necked and hard-hearted against God and his ways and his righteousness and his laws and commandments. Even so, God would withhold his hand of judgment in order that this plan of salvation might be implemented and that the message of that way of salvation might be preached to many, many people in the history of this world. And so for that reason, this full and final judgment that will yet one kind come will be withheld 
until the Saviour would come and until the gospel of salvation would be preached and until multitudes of people from across the whole wide world would be brought to saving faith. That's why, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and so forth, would be perpetuated, and the judgment that this world is without question deserving of would be withheld. Now, this is not to say, and God did not say here, that there wouldn't be, as it were, local judgments as opposed to a worldwide or universal judgment. And it's not to say that there would not even be widespread judgments such as we've been experiencing in recent times. You think of local floods, you think of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions which have caused tremendous disruption and, and uh, so forth across the earth from time to time and plagues that have come. All this is for sin and all these serve as warnings of a future judgment that is to come but not this wiping out, as it were, in judgment of the whole race of humanity. And why? Because God would preserve man in order that the saviour might come, the gospel message might be preached, and a whole multitude might be brought in before the end. This is the covenant. This is the promise and the reason for the promise that God would withhold the judgment that the world is deserving of. But why the token? Why the rainbow? Verse 12 of chapter 9 says, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For perpetual generations, this is the token. Now, what does this word token signify? Well, it signifies a sign, an indication or it, it signifies a seal. In other words, it ratifies the promise that is being, being made in terms of the covenant as being true and as being certain. This promise, this covenant that God has entered into is not something that will be annulled or rescinded and forgotten about. God will not flare up in anger when he is provoked by heinous sins and crimes against him in the future? No. And while the earth remaineth until the end of the age will finally come, God promises to remember his covenant and the rainbow is given as a sure token and a sure evidence, if you like, that God will remember his covenant promise. Now, in verses 14 to 16, God speaks about looking upon the bow. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So he puts the bow in the cloud, and he says that when the bow is there, he will look upon the bow. And to bring a cloud then, in verse 14, is an indication, as I said before, that the putting of the bow in the cloud, the ordering of those meteorological conditions which produce the bow, are a deliberate action on the part of God. These are not incidental or accidental. We look above and beyond all of this to God who is the sovereign over all and the God who alone controls all things, including the weather and the, the positioning of clouds and the rainfall and the sunshine and all of these things. He brings all of these things together as a deliberate act on his part that there might be a bow, a rainbow there in the sky, in the cloud. And he does so in verse 15, 
that he might by this cloud remember, or this bow, remember his covenant, his covenant promise made to Noah, to flesh and to creatures upon the earth. And he will look upon this bow in verse 16. He will specifically and deliberately look upon the bow, as it were, to say to himself, yes, I have made my covenant, my covenant promise, and my promise stands firm and secure, and I uphold my promise. I do not rescind my promise. My promise stands firm and certain. This is the purpose of the rainbow in that sense. Now, of course, we know better of God than to think for one moment that God can forget something. You and I forget things. That's why we have to have memory prompts and write notes upon pieces of paper and so forth. But we must never think that God is like that. God does not forget things. God does not forget his promises. And God certainly does not break his promises. And so why is it that God has set a bow in the cloud that he will look upon and that will, as it were, cause him to remember his covenant promise? Well, it's not for the sake of any failing memory on his part. All of this is for our sakes. It's God's way of telling us and of reassuring us that, yes, he remembers his covenant promise and he will keep his covenant promise. He has promised not to flood the earth and not to destroy all flesh as he did before by a flood. No, he has promised to preserve all flesh. For the Saviour has come. And by the Saviour, many in the course of the history of this world will be brought to believe upon him and to know the salvation that God has given through his own son. We're assured and reassured by the sight of the rainbow that God will keep his covenant promise. This, in the end, is about God's faithfulness. He sets the bow in the sky, in the cloud, that we may look upon that cloud and we see it as his token of that promise which he has kept thus far and will keep until the end of the age. And this in spite of all the extreme and dreadful provocation that is sent heavenwards by man's sin and rebellion. The bow is there that he may look upon it, but the bow is there for our sakes, that we might be reassured of God's covenant faithfulness. But you see, that leads us to realise something else, of course, that's so obvious. Verse 13 and 14 again, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Well, we've already noticed that God looks upon the, the, um, on the bow that's in the cloud. But obviously, we can look upon the bow that's in the cloud. We can look upon it. It's something that's visible and clear to us. Now, we saw at the end of chapter 8 that God had it in his mind. It was in his heart not to flood the earth again. But that would be hidden. That would be concealed to us. But God has made known that promise and that covenant, and that in two ways. First of all, we have God's word here before us that reassures us that he does not forget and will not forget his covenant, covenant promise. But what he has done for us is to set the bow in the sky and in the clouds from time to time that we may see the bow and that our minds may be immediately led away to the God who has set the bow in the cloud, that we may know that there is a covenant promise that God will keep. So the next time we see the dark clouds in one direction, from, from behind us, the sun begins to shine and the sun's rays shine into those 
the rain that is falling from those dark clouds that are in front of us, and we see a rainbow. Our minds do not simply dwell upon the fact that this is a wonderful and a beautiful sight. Our minds should be diverted away to the God who put that rainbow there at that specific time that we might remember so many wonderful things about our God. First of all, he's real. He's real. He's a God that moves and works. And he's a God who's righteous and just. It takes us back to the destruction of the world in those days of Noah. Man deserved that terrible judgment. Yes, God is a just and a righteous God. And he will judge the world again. This covenant promise only stands while the earth remaineth. There will be a further judgment in the years that are to come. Oh, but this is what we're specifically and wonderfully meant to understand, that this same God, who is just and righteous and who does not fail to punish sin in one way or another, is a merciful God. And he withholds that judgment for a time. Why? That men and women and young people may repent of their sins and turn to him while there is yet time to find salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. See a rainbow and think to yourself, God withholds judgment that I may repent and turn to him before that final and furious judgment comes at the end of the age. The rainbow, as it were, preaches the gospel to us. It tells us everything. It tells us about God as real. It tells us about God's justice as terrible, his righteousness as being so pure and so holy and so unchangeable that's above us to, to attain to and that we're lost and we're in sin and that there's a judgment to come. Oh, but there's mercy to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. See the rainbow and see the wonderful manifold person of God in all his attributes, all the colors of a rainbow. Speak to us about the various colors and hues of God's person and justice and judgment and grace and patience, compassion, long suffering and mercy and salvation that's to be known through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the covenant and the reason for the rainbow and the final question is simply this. Is there more to it than we have seen thus far? And there is, and I can only give you, for time's sake, a little indication of what this is. We speak of a covenant, a promise, a promise that is made by God here to Noah and to flesh. But what this covenant makes us think about, if we know anything about the rest of the scriptures, is another covenant, another covenant, and another covenant upon which this covenant depends and stands. It's a covenant that is not simply about a promise to withhold a judgment. It is a covenant made in order to provide the salvation that we have considered this morning. It's a covenant and an agreement that is made in eternity and not between God and man, but between God and God. The triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, specifically and particularly, more preeminently between the Father and the Son. What is this covenant about? Well, you think of God before there was ever a world. And God foresees that world in all its sin and unrighteousness and with the judgment that it will deserve. Ah, but God in his mercy determined that there would be a way to save a people for himself. And so what does God do? God and the three the persons of the Godhead enter into a covenant and agreement between themselves. And the Father agrees that with the Son that the Son would come into the world 
to make a sacrifice for sin and the father on his part would forgive those people for their sins on the grounds of what the son of God had done in dying for their sins. And then of course, the Holy Spirit comes into play and the Holy Spirit comes to convict people of their sin and of their need and of the Lord Jesus Christ and his wonderful salvation. So you think of it of this way, before there was a world, before sin actually came in, God foresees all of this and makes a way. Go into the world, says the Father to the Son, and be a saviour. Yes, I will go, says the Son to the Father. And he came, and he became a man. And he became a man in order to die for our sins. And then God the Father and God the Son says to the Spirit, go and announce this wonderful way of salvation and bring people to conviction, and bring them to faith, and bring them to salvation. And he does, and he does. And this is a covenant between the Father and the Son, and also the Spirit. And you see, when we see the rainbow, and we think of God's postponement of this great judgment that is yet to come, we think, ah, this is the reason for it. There's a saviour to turn to. And God has had us in his mind from eternity. And there's a way to be redeemed. There's a way for me to be saved from my sin and from my condemnation and from my judgment that I'm so worthy of and deserving of. And oh, I must come to this saviour and I must trust in him and I must turn from my unbelief and my sinful ways and I'll be saved. I will be saved. God's covenant promise, it will not be rescinded, it will not be annulled, and I will be saved because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the covenant that we're made to think of. Now, we read earlier on in the service, and I mustn't dwell on this for, for very long, but in chapter four of the book of Revelation, there are other passages in the in the scriptures, not many of them, but there's a passage in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 28, if you want to look it up. Also in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1. But chapter 4 of Revelation and verse 3, there's another reference to this rainbow. And there John is taken up to see glimpses by vision of, of the heavenly place. And the throne of God is central to all of this. And the throne of God where from where God rules over all things and at all times, what do we see represented there? But a rainbow, a rainbow, what do you think? Now, the view that God, John describes of the rainbow makes the thought of a rainbow seem even more remarkable and more wonderful than we can see from the aspect and, and the prospect there of Genesis chapter 4. This is not a rainbow of 180 degrees. We can only see an arc. What John sees is the throne of God from which God rules over all of the world, over all of history, over all of his church. And the throne of God is encircled completely from 100, 360 degrees by a rainbow. And that rainbow by all indications here, is not a bow that sometimes appears. It's a rainbow that is permanently surrounding the throne of God. Now, what's the purpose of this vision? If I can put it like this, it's given to John and to us to indicate, if I can put it like this, that when God looks from his throne at the world that he has made, and he looks at you and he looks at me this morning before he sees anything else. He sees his covenant promise. And he operates according to his covenant promise. And he works according to that covenant promise. Over all things and at all times. It's a sight that's given to us in this vision that God will remember 
his covenant promise. He's put the promise, he put the rainbow completely around his throne. Imagine that. To tell us that he is bound to his covenant promise. There will not be the destruction of flesh and the earth by flood. Yes, that's one thing. But it takes us away to this other covenant that I've described very briefly. This covenant promise given to his son, whereby all whose faith is in him shall be saved and shall be delivered from the wrath that is to come. Now for a believer, for a Christian, here's our hope. And here's the grounds and the certainty of our hope. When we consider God, and especially when we see the clouds and the darkness and the difficulties of our lives, and when we see the dark clouds brought upon us by our own consciences and by a, an awareness of our sin, and we see that we deserve a judgment that's to come. When we consider God, what's the first thing that we're meant to see? The rainbow, the mercy and the kindness and the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of it all. Think of him. Think of his covenant promise. Think of the definite certainty of the salvation that's yours and mine by the Lord Jesus Christ. So whose rainbow is it? It doesn't belong to groups and people upon this earth, whoever they may be. It's God's promise and God's rainbow that we're meant to think about here and what promises there are and what wonders of grace that are to be found and all because of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful to every word of his promise in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank God from the bottom of our hearts for so great a salvation. May God bless these things to us. Now I'm going to read the words of a hymn this morning, speaking about a covenant, the words from hymn 567. And the opening line speaks about David's Lord. Well, David's Lord was the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just mention that by way of explanation here. It helps us to understand the meaning of the words of the hymn. With David's Lord and ours, a covenant once was made whose bonds are firm and sure, whose glories ne'er shall fade, signed by the sacred three in one, in mutual love ere time begun. Firm as the lasting hills, this covenant shall endure, whose powerful shells and wills make every blessing sure. When ruin shakes all nature's frame, its promises shall stand the same. Here the vast seas of grace, of love and mercy flow, more than the blood-bought race on earth can grasp or know. O sacred deep without a shore, who shall thy wonders here explore? Here, when our feet shall fall, its mercy we shall see, grace to restore the soul, and pardon full and free. We with delight shall God behold, as sheep restored to Zion's fold. And when through Jordan's flood our God shall bid us go, he shall our souls defend and vanquish every foe. And in this covenant we shall view sufficient strength to bear us through. Let's join in prayer together. Lord, we thank thee for thy wonderful ways with us. We thank thee for the way of salvation that has been made known to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank thee for every covenant promise that comes to us in and through him, especially for the forgiveness of sin and the granting of life that's everlasting. 
O oh Lord, we thank thee for every sign, every pledge, every promise that we have in thy word. We thank thee too for even the signs from the natural world that show to us and reinforce upon our minds the faithfulness of our God to his word of promise. So help us to keep these things in our hearts and may our faith really and truly be in the Lord Jesus. And may we go on from day to day in that faith, knowing that our God is a saving God and that his promises stand sure forever and forever. So we worship thee and praise thee together. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Well, may God bless you through the day, and I hope you'll be able to join us again for our evening service, which is at 6.30 tonight.